Welcome to Summer Oasis. So glad that you guys made it tonight. There's a lot more of you than I thought there would be, which is super awesome. It's cool that there's so many still around the summer or willing to come back for a night. Um, so Summer Oasis, if you've never been before, we do a little bit different. We just try to have an opportunity to connect. And if you've missed it, what we're doing this summer is a pseudo series called Pastor's Picks. So because we only meet once a month, it's kind of hard to do a series that's cohesive because you have a month in between things, it's easy to forget. So each pastor who's preaching um, in those three services gets to pick their own topic, what they wanna bring, what God's been teaching them, what he's been sharing. And I get to kick that off tonight. Um, and I'm just gonna be upfront with you and tell you I'm gonna do something a little bit different than probably what you're used to. Oftentimes we do sermon series that are based around a theme <laughs> or a big idea or a topic. And those are great and I love them. Um, but as I was doing some own study, my own studying this summer, I did something a little bit different for myself and I really enjoyed it. And so I wanted to be able to bring it to you and to share with you what God was teaching me through that. And so instead of um, having a big idea or a big thought for the night and then building on that, we're actually just gonna open up First Peter. We're gonna look at the whole book, what it is, who wrote it, all of those things. Um, and learn a little bit. And I hope that there's two parts to this, that not only do you get to learn what's in the scripture as an encouragement for you to walk away, but maybe even some aspects of what it could look like for you to study scripture on your own. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through the method that I used to study First Peter earlier this um, spring. Um, at some key questions I asked, ways that have helped me to understand the scripture a little bit more. So hopefully you get kind of two parts of learning tonight, and that can be an encouragement for you as you continue to study the word. So we're going to open up 1 Peter, if you've got it, um, you can open up your Bible. We're not going to read the whole book. It's not very long, but we don't have time for that. So we'll do um, some synopsis here and there. But when I study scripture, whenever I open it up and I'm planning to read, there's some key questions that I ask right away. The first thing that I always ask is who is the author of the passage that I'm about to read? So 1 Peter is written by Peter, the disciple Peter. The Peter who was originally named Simon, who was a fisherman alongside his brother in the field, the same job that his father has had, um, the same Peter, the same Simon, who Jesus said, throw your net on the other side of the boat, and then they caught in an insane amount of fish after having caught nothing. The same Simon who um, Jesus called alongside his brother to be one of his disciples, the one who was part of Jesus' inner circle, his inner three with James and John, who Jesus chose to live closely with, his close friends who gave, he gave leadership positions to among the disciples. The same disciple, Simon, who Jesus gave a new name, Peter, which is the English kind of translation of Cephas. So if you've ever been reading in the Gospels and you see the same Cephas, that's who we're talking about. If it's Simon, that's who we're talking about. If it's Cephas, that's who we're talking about. If it's Peter, that's who we're talking about. He gets three different names, but they, they mean rock. And Jesus gives him this new name because he's saying that, Peter, you are gonna be the rock that I build my church on. Names had significance in this time. They spoke to who people were and part of what they did. And so Jesus intentionally changed Simon's name to Peter to communicate this important um, aspect of Peter's life, of who he would be and the role that Jesus was asking him to step into. And Peter, there's so many stories about him in the, in the Gospels. He's the one who's recognized to be the first to claim Jesus as the Messiah. He's the same Peter who walked on water when Jesus called him out of the boat. He's the same Peter who saw visions and preached and alongside other disciples cast out demons and provided healings. He's the same Peter who denied Jesus three times at his death and then was later, later forgiven and reinstated by Jesus after the resurrection. This is the Peter who preached on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon the people and revealed his power. And this is the same Peter who died a martyr for his faith. And the same Peter who the Catholic Church actually recognizes as the first Pope. So the first question, who is the author of the text that we're reading? It's Peter. That's who we're looking at. That is who this is written. And then the second question that I like to ask is what is the genre of this? So the Bible consists of a lot of different genres. There's songs, there's poems, there's historical narrative, there's historical accounts. Um, and this is a letter that Peter wrote to a specific group of people. And so that third question becomes, who is the original audience? And so Peter, in this letter, alongside many other letter writers, will tell you who they're writing to at the beginning. And so Peter 1, 1 through 2 says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been 
chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood, grace and peace be yours in abundance. So Peter is intentionally writing a letter to a group of people who are exiles in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. I also like to know where these places are when I'm reading scripture, so I looked up a map so that you can also know. So these are located in Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey, and if you zoom in on the map, you can see specifically where they're located. So Peter is writing this letter to the exiles, the believers, who are spread about this region, and that's who he's writing to. That gives me context for what I'm about to read and what's taking place. Because then, the next question I like to ask is why is the author writing? What's the purpose? And this is where we start to get into it, and sometimes you have to read the whole bit of text to get into this. But Peter kind of gives us a little bit of a synopsis. Again, back in chapter 1, verses 3 through 9, he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all of this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the the salvation of your souls. As you continue to read the rest of the letter, Peter will unpack this, but I'll summarize it for you for your sake um, instead of reading all of the book. Peter writes this letter of encouragement to believers who are living under a different rule. That is his purpose. That is who he's writing to. That's why he's writing. And all of this context for me helps me to understand what I'm about to read, why it's important, why he wrote it, and helps me to begin to then dive into it and understand it better. So when I read scripture, this is the first four steps that I like to do. And sometimes you read quite a bit to find these answers. But then what I like to do is I like to see a map of what is this passage gonna look like, especially when I'm reading a big chunk of scripture. And so Peter is broken, or first Peter is broken down into a couple different categories. He begins with a greeting, followed by a song of praise, and that's what we've both already read, these two main sections, the greeting to who he's talking to and the praise to God, kind of setting the foundation for what he's going to be continuing to talk about. And then from there, there are three, three primary encouragements that Peter gives to his reader. And that's what we're going to unpack a little bit and get into them. And so the first of these is that Peter recognizes that the people of God are a new family identity. Let's continue to read in chapter 2. This is what Peter says. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Because of this new identity in Christ... Peter is recognizing that sin and death no longer have power over God's people. And he proclaims that God's people are then called to holiness. Back in chapter 1, he says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Peter proclaims this truth to the people, that God has called them his people, that he has called them to be set apart, to be different, out of the old life that they've lived in. Jesus has forgiven sins, provided salvation, freed his people from the power that sin and death once had over them. And so Peter is giving this encouragement to his audience to live in that freedom. And he recognizes that it's an ongoing process. It's not a singular moment when everything's perfect and nothing, there's nothing to be learned, but that it's an ongoing process. In chapter 2, he says, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. 
now that you have tested that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so Peter again reminds the people that in that freedom that God has given them, that Jesus has paid for on the cross, that now they are called to pursue holiness, that they are called to continue to grow as God's people, to grow in faith and understanding and obedience, recognizing that it's a process that they go through, that like a child craves milk to grow and to be strong, we too as people need a nourishment. And that nourishment comes from remaining close to God, comes from being present in the scripture and, and learning more about who God is. And so Peter gives this first encouragement as he reminds the people of their identity and the family of God, as he reminds them of the history that they are a part of. He'll continue in this passage of scripture to talk about uh, the nation of Israel and what God had done in their presence and how they now, as people living in this Asia Minor region, are part of that family of God. And this sets the foundation for him to continue into the next section. The second section that Peter addresses is suffering. A suffering as one who witnesses to the truth of Jesus. But the encouragement that Peter gives in the midst of this is that God can persevere, God's people can persevere through hardship by the power of the Spirit within them and the example of Jesus Christ. Peter was present on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon the people when he saw the crazy things that happened because the Spirit was present there with them. And so he continues to encourage them to continue to press into this suffering, recognizing that they have the power of the Holy Spirit before them. Chapter 2, 19 through 21, he says, For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. In chapter 3, he'll say, For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. And then again in chapter 4, he'll say, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin, as a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for hu evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Peter recognizes that the people where they're living, the place that they are in, the reality that they live in is that they're in a world that is contrary to what Jesus has called them into. He recognizes that there are cultural practices around them that, that cause them to live in certain ways that aren't what God desires. He recognizes that there are both religious and secular governances over the people dictating how they live. And he warns them to um, continue to press in in the midst of that hardship, not to give in to what is wrong, but to suffer through that for a variety of reasons, for two key reasons. Because the encouragement that he gives is to persevere in faith through that suffering. And the reason that we're able to do that is what Peter will address in the third section. Is that there is a future hope that we hold as God's people. And so we could persevere through suffering because of that future hope. He'll continue on to say in chapter 4, If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. He'll say in chapter 5, be alert and of sober mind. We've already heard him say that once. Your enemy, the devil, prowls like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. Peter recognizes the reality of what the life that the people live in, that there's hardship, that the world expects them to be a certain way, that Jesus has called them to be something else. But he is so confident that the life that God has for his people is worth the suffering they will face because he knows the reward and the blessing that is promised by God. 
promised in the Old Testament scriptures that he knows and studies promised in the life of Jesus and how he taught and the things that he encouraged people in. And he knows in the promise that Jesus left when he ascended into heaven. And so people, or Peter encourages the people to do what is right, even if there is hardship, because he recognizes that that will give benefit to their life as they, give, as they honor God, as they glorify him, and then also as they become a witness to the people around them. That when the world around them tells them that there are specific roles that they're supposed to play as husbands and wives, that women are less than, are less valuable, Jesus has said that's wrong. Jesus has said, you are of equal value and worth. And so Peter encourages the people, set that example in the way that you live in your household. Be that example to the people around you, even when it's different, even when it's countercultural. So Peter gives them these three encouragements, and then he finishes the letter, because it's a letter, you have to give a final closing, with just that. He says, right at the end, 5, 10 through 11, and the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Again, Peter encourages them to remain in Christ, to allow the strength of God and the witness of Jesus and those around them to be their source of perseverance in the midst of hardship. And so this is what the book of 1 Peter looks like if you map it out. I like to see the big picture. I like to understand what's happening, what's taking place. And so for me, this is helpful. When you look, you open the Bible and there's three pages of text. I like to see a map. I like to be able to understand what is happening. And I hope that you've noticed that as we've done this, all that we've done is find out context and history for the text we've read. All that we've done is read it. We didn't read the whole thing. I did that for you. And then all that we've done is observe what's taking place in scripture and interpret what Peter is saying. We haven't yet turned to application. Sometimes when we read scripture, it can be easy to want to, as we read, say, okay, how does this apply to me? What do I need to do with this? And that's an important step, but it's an important last step. Because if you cut off the observation process, if you don't read all the way through, if you don't take the time to learn what's there first, there's things that we can miss. So all that I've done is read and observe and say, what is here in this text And now at the end, now that I've read it all, now that I see what's there, now that I have a big picture of what's taking place, I get to ask those application questions. I get to ask, what am I supposed to do with what I've learned? How is what this text has shared changed my life? Because if we open the scripture and we read it, and it doesn't change who we are, we've missed the opportunity that God asked us to step into in that. And so we can begin to reflect on these questions. What am I supposed to learn from this? What is, how is this supposed to change my life? And one key thing that you can do in the midst of this is say, how do I compare to the original audience? Peter wrote this to someone else. He didn't write it to Jaina, living in 2023. He wrote it to a specific group of people. So how do I compare? What's similar about me to them? What's different? And we actually are quite similar to Peter's original audience. Many of us are believers. We're part of the family of God. We've been adopted into his family. We live in a world where there's different lordships, there's different rulers vying for our our allegiance, vying for how we should live our life, both religious and secular authorities trying to tell us um, how our lives should be lived. We already face suffering, we face hardship because of life and the world we live in, because of faith, because we're asked to be people who look different than the world. And so we can take the same things that Peter has spoken to his original audience and say, this can apply to me too. This can be applicable in my life. This can encourage me. So let's personalize it. And as I looked at that overall map, I said, okay, what are the the big things that Peter wanted to speak to his audience that I can also then learn and take away? And I come back to those three big sections. The first, live out of that new identity. Pursue the process of holiness. Be holy as God is holy. Live in the freedom that God has given. Step into the call that God has for you to be holy as he is holy, knowing that it's an ongoing process, knowing that you need nourishment and spiritual milk to build you up, to continue to learn and to grow. So pursue that. Find ways to learn. Read the scripture. Get in Christian community. Find ways to continue to grow in nourishment living in the freedom that Jesus has given you, recognizing the identity that you carry as his part of of God's family. And then from there, rely on God in hardship and suffering. 
the life that God has for you won't be one of easiness. There won't be any hardship. That's not the case. Scripture promises us the opposite. It promises us that life with Christ will be hard. Because we live in a world where there are dictating circumstances, when there are um, places and and spheres within our culture that are contrary to God and his message. And so there will be hardship. There will be places where things are difficult. But we know, just as Peter has reminded, just as we're reminded as we read scripture, that the Holy Spirit dwells within us. The Holy Spirit is present in the midst of all of that hardship. And so we can trust and rely on the Holy Spirit to guide us in the midst of that. And we can look to the example of Christ to continue to live in the midst of that hardship to continue to live in a world where there's a dominion of different rulers who wants to dictate things of how our life should live. And Jesus continually spoke out against that and turned things upside down. So what does it look like for you, for me, to live differently in a world that says we need to look one way that's different than what Jesus asks of us? What does it look like to be people who care more for the, the needs of others than our own need, our own pursuits? We could do so many examples, specifics, and all of you will have different things that God is calling you specific to. But what does it look like to be different in the midst of hardship, in the midst of suffering, to continue to give glory to God? Because then three, the third thing, is to receive the blessing and hope for what is to come. Let that dictate how you live your life. Have a hope in the future promises of God that we see in Scripture that we see as he speaks and moves, as the Holy Spirit is present in our world, hope in the resurrection and the eternity that we get to spend in heaven with God in the resurrected new body without pain or fear or hardship, have hope in the healing that God promises to do here on the earth as well as what he'll do after. Hope again in the coming Jesus who is going to make a difference, who is going to make life more significant and more powerful. So as I read this, First Peter, those are the three things that I said, what do I walk away from this? And then I like to summarize it. I like to put it into one complete kind of thought. So this is how I'd summarize it. You have been chosen by the Most High, and he gives you power and strength through the presence of his Holy Spirit to become holy as he is holy and to overcome suffering with faith and hope for what is to come. As I studied First Peter, this is what I walked away from it with. And this is an impacting how my life has looked over the last several weeks. That as school finishes up, as people graduate, people leave, things are hard, things are difficult, life is changing and new. I can persevere because the presence of the Holy Spirit lives within me as I continue to live in relationship with God, as I live out of the freedom that he has given me, the identity he has given me as his child. And I can have hope for the promises that God has for the future faith and hope for what he has yet to come. So this is my example of what it looks like to read scripture, to study it. I hope that you get some ideas that can be encouragement to you there. But then I also hope that 1 Peter is just an encouragement to you. Because I think it is. It's a beautiful letter written to a specific group of people, but with so much insight and impact for us today that can change how we live our life. I'm going to invite the band back up to get ready. But I encourage you, wherever you're at this summer, whatever you're doing, take the time to continue to pursue relationship with God. Take the time to read his word, to continue to be in Christian community, whether it's here once a month at Oasis, whether it's part of the small group, whether it's in the community that you are a part of. Continue to draw near to God and he will continue to draw near to you. Seek after that spiritual nourishment, that milk that will build you up that will help you to grow in the holiness that God desires for you, that you can become more and more the person that he has created you to be. So let me pray and we'll continue to worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for tonight. We thank you that um, we get to be part of your family, that you have given us a new identity as sons and daughters, that you have freed us um, from the power that sin and death once had on us. Um, that we are made new because of Jesus and what he's done and that in the midst of hardship and suffering, whatever it may be, from the small things to the greatest um, things that come up in life, that we can trust that your spirit is present with us, that you are working and moving and that you have called us to something more and we can trust in the hope and the promise for the future that you have given us. And so I pray that you would 
um, continue to be with us in our worship, can you continue to be with us in our fellowship as we um, just continue to be part of your family, as we continue um, to give you honor and glory. We love you and we thank you and praise you for who you are. It's in your name that we pray.